All right, hello everybody. It's gonna go ahead and make sure everything's working. What up, Proco people? All these uh, Stan Prokopenko fans. The Kingslayer, hello everyone. Hello chat, hello familiar faces that I see. All right, I can hear myself, that's good. I'm gonna go ahead and mute that. Um, we're gonna have a fun little live stream today. I'm gonna talk about some stuff, some art things, some drawing things, some painting things, painting heads and faces here and there. And here I have joined with me, I think, uh, a couple of people, if you want to reveal yourselves. Hello, um, I'm trying to reveal myself. <laughs> I have to <laughs> yeah, we got uh, Mr. Modern Day James, as well as Mr. Christian Knees. Is it just Knees? Is that how you say it? No, well, my last name is Christian Knee. But, knee? Uh, my name is Christian's Knees. There we go. I'm laughing. That's funny. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I, I like how I'm the center of this. Yeah. <laughs> You're the center friends. of attention here. Yeah. 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 Hey, Kelly. Hey, everyone. Oh, look at that. That's Christian. It's modern day James. Um, we, we should get the other James on, on, on the feed. Yeah. Arguably <laughs> the more important James. <laughs> yeah. With the uh, good old John. Wow. Ava Pelko's here. What a traitor. Um, all right, cool. Uh, so we're going to be doing some drawings. I'll we'll be taking some questions and my, my good friends here will be fielding those questions and relaying them to me as I draw and they may even answer them with me. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, be sure to click the link or type in proco.com. Oh, wait, we got the baby. Oh, <laughs> disappeared. Uh, so I'm watching the uh, delay on YouTube. Oh, you got to watch it in the uh, stream. Uh, I, foolish me, I was looking at the chat. Uh, yeah, so let's see. The If you have questions, don't type it in the chat. Go to the link on the screen, yeah. please. For the link. Type that in, type your questions there. And and uh, we'll we'll try to get back to you um, if we see the thing. Uh, having said that, I think we could probably switch over to uh, my. Well, any, anything to add, Christian? Or oh, yeah, perfect. That was great. I yeah. think you were going to make the best paintings anyone's ever seen, and uh, they should go subscribe to your channel. Uh, what's the oh, channel? Yeah. Oh, I forgot. I, I didn't even <laughs> introduce myself. I just yeah, yeah I assumed everybody knew me. You are not Proco. I don't know if the the chat's aware of that. Yeah, my name is Ahmed Alduri. I have a YouTube channel as well. Uh, concept artist, illustrator, uh, worked on games and movies and blah, blah, blah. And uh, currently I'm teaching and I have, <laughs> I want to see Steven Zapata. Me too. I hope he, I hope he crashes <laughs> this party. Um, yeah, I recently released a course. Uh, I have some content on the Proco website and there's a discount on that today. I also have some other course content online elsewhere. We can talk about that throughout the, the stream and I'll be answering your questions. All right, cool. I'm going to switch okay. over to my desktop. Um, so we're going to have to lose these other beautiful faces. Also, James has a YouTube channel, Modern Day James. Who? I, I, I do. And I just yeah. want to say quickly, I've made it a habit or tradition. Every time I'm on the Proco channel, I wear some sort of metal t-shirt. So just a little nice. shout out to Meshuggah. I'm uh, sugar. Yeah. Last right. time was Dillinger Escape Plan, so I'm just just keeping it metal. That's all I have to say. <laughs> cool. I'm all right. I, I just have a t-shirt. I just have a nice shirt on. Oh. Yeah, I got my. Uh, I'm, I'm representing the good old draftsman, and that's what we're going to be drawing today. Um, doing some fan art of Marshall and Stan. I kind of got started ahead of time as a warm up to make sure I actually can do it. Uh, so here we go. Um, I'll be drawing that, and feel free to draw along. I'll have my references open. Over here, I'll probably start on another Marshall drawing. And uh, please notice that on the bottom left of your screen, you can see the tools that I'm using. So I know people are going to be asking, how am I putting the reference on like this? Huh. Well, if you look at the bottom left, it's right there. All right, so uh, AKG, K two, no, these are Sennheiser headphones. Uh, lovely t-shirt made, yes, good old Draftsman. Uh, yeah, cool. Let's let the, um, are there any questions yet? Uh, yeah, yeah, there are a couple. Oh. Let, me, uh, let me see. Um, Ruby T says, how do you find and maintain your own artistic identity when sharing your work online? I've been posting my work online since I started taking art more seriously and it's gotten to the point where I don't know what I actually like drawing versus what what's popular and gives the most validation. Do you have any tips for re rediscovering what you truly enjoy creating? 
Yeah, I would say uh, right off the bat, go to the the most recent uh, live stream with Stephen Zapata, and there's a section where he talks specifically about that, where you know each artist has a sort of responsibility to sit down and contemplate that exact question, and not just to think about it, but to write it down and look at it on paper. And when you when you have it on paper, it's totally true. It kind of speaks back to you, and uh, you can sort of map out what what you like, what you don't like, what you truly want to do, what you want to avoid. Um, and mapping it out like that is probably the best thing you could do. Um, also, imagine yourself in a in an apocalypse. No one exists anymore in the world except you. Question one is, are you still doing art? And question two is, what will that art be? So I don't know, just imagine scenarios like that. I don't know if uh, you guys want to add something to that. Um, no, that's good. I, I, a question I ask a lot of people is, uh, what, what would you be doing with a billion dollars? Like, would you be doing the exact same thing as you're doing right now, even if you know you had the time and resources to to not do it? And if the answer is no, then um, you should probably stop doing it. Um, which is pretty similar to your uh, response. Um, James, got anything to add to that? I have nothing to add except for. Um, I think it's a little dangerous to be thinking about the apocalypse all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I'm playing a lot of Bloodborne. I, I, I actually do have a, a, something to contribute, which is for me, I think art is always about um, trying to sort of figure out what your innate instincts are and not fighting against that necessarily. Um, I'll give an example from my own experience, which is um, I don't like to spend a lot of time sitting and, and rendering a bunch of stuff uh, the way that you might want to spend a lot of hours on a painting. Um, so I'm drawn to more sketchy things. Like I'm really enjoying storyboarding because it's very quick. So I kind of allow myself to focus on things that work towards my personality type. Mm, yeah. And, and I think that's a, a lot of art is like that. Just figure out, basically gear it towards your personality. Absolutely. You're even uh, doing animations and, and all that. Perhaps I am. Which I may or may not be collaborating with you on. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. All right. Indeed. So I'm going to repeat this uh, for the second time. If you have a question, don't ask it in the chat. Go to the link on the screen. Ask it there so we can actually see it. Otherwise, it's just going to get lost in the in the chat. Hmm. I have a question for you, Ahmed and James. Um, yes. What is your apocalypse plan? All right. So. I thought about this a lot, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> clearly, uh, just kidding. Um, I don't know what kind of apocalypse. What are we talking like a nuclear uh, fallout? Well, I, I, I guess. I guess the, the there are a couple. The, the two obvious ones are a zombie apocalypse and a nuclear apocalypse, like Fallout or you know Walking Dead style. Zombie apocalypse. I think I go to the nearest, um, you know, sporting goods store, try to get some weapons. Uh, I mean, I have like some knives, but that's not really hmm. good for that sitch. Um, yeah, I'd probably like uh, hole up, make a pretty safe fort somehow, somewhere, and start building connections with other survivors and try to take out all the zombies. I don't know. I'm uh, I'm gonna hunker down here. Uh, I have a fallout shelter in my apartment apparently so i'm gonna go there i'm gonna turn on my my friends and roommates quickly uh i'll just keep them because i might run out of sustenance so right. I'll, I'll i'll get their you know i'll take their food get their sustenance as quickly as i can and just try to hold off for as long as i can mm -hmm. right. right and that applies to both scenarios zombies so or or how uh, quickly would you uh revert to cannibalism like a week? Oh, probably week one. Week one. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, a couple well, days maybe. You I'll, I'll save some experience with this. Well, yeah. I, I suspect it, it not. It wouldn't even necessarily take a zombie apocalypse for you to. <laughs> to <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah. No, I've been thinking about doing that anyway. So um, the zombie uh, apocalypse will just like give me a little, you know, a little more incentive. Guards, yeah. uh, remove <laughs> this man. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, Thanks for Let's your see. comments. Why are people so hyped about Elden Ring? Because there, it needs no explanation. We we discussed this actually. Do you want to discuss your um your take on or your transformation of your your feelings about souls and and Bloodborne? 
Sure. Well, my friends, the year was 2015. I was a concept artist over at ArenaNet. I thought I was hot shot. And Bloodborne came out. Was it 2015? I think something like that. And I was like, wow, that game looks really cool. I'm going to purchase it. And so I bought it. I've never played a Souls-like game. It's my first time. And I tried it. And I was like, this is dumb. I hate this. Why would they make it so purposefully hard? I don't know what I'm doing. Where's the where's the icon on the map of where I'm supposed to go? Right? So I was used to games like that. And then uh, fast forward till now, a couple months ago, uh, Captain Steven Zapata was here at my place. Actually, we were doing, we were filming the the, uh, con the contest uh, reactions for, for the Proco challenge for the UFO thing. And he uh, started talking about Bloodborne and how he's so into it. And I was like, why? All right, okay, show me, because I hate the game. And then he, then we get the game, we download it onto my PS4, because uh, I gave my actual copy to my brother. And he just starts playing it and explaining it. And I'm like, starting to get it. And uh, I eventually, after he left, I, I tried playing the game and had a blast. And it's like, once you learn the concept of, you know, it's not about it being an easy experience because that's not what real life is like. Real life is like you go forth, fail at something, come back, find a better way to do it, and rinse and repeat. And that's exactly what the Souls games does. Uh, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Elden Ring, um, Sekiro, and that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah, and the, uh, the stories are surprisingly captivating. Yes, yeah. Bloodborne's lore was incredible. I'm still not over it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I've never had the patience for any of the Souls games. It certainly requires patience, so I understand. I tried playing Dark Souls after Bloodborne. So I'm like, okay, well, now that I get it, I, I couldn't get into the first Dark Souls. It's pretty clunky and slow, and I, I think it would require more patience than I have. Um, right. But I might just hop over to Dark Souls 3. I have a, a question um, that I think actually will be relevant to art and not just playing video games. Um, when you look at a game like that, right, uh, there's a lot of designs in Dark Souls that I would consider somewhat campy, especially the first one. They're a little, um, they're not always the greatest, but the game plays out well. And I almost kind of like it when the designs are kind of silly in a way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not phrasing this question properly, but um, I guess, like, what what is your take on it when you see that? Do you think that's contributing to it? Do you think, oh, that's lazy design? Or do you think... That's something that you can actually uh, appreciate, and maybe it's time constraints. Maybe it's they're going; they're not taking it too seriously. Well, uh, I mean, when I saw the Elden Ring trailer, the art was to me, I mean, nothing spectacular. It looks like every other fantasy, high fantasy game at first, right? Uh, you have guy wearing armor, a girl wearing armor. You got dragons. Okay, well, there's really nothing new here. But knowing the context of the gameplay, uh, as it doesn't matter how generic those designs are, uh, it doesn't matter because it's not about the designs. If it, if it was supposed to be an art gallery, that's one thing, or some kind of showcase of um, unique designs, then sure, maybe we can measure it against that. But uh, that's not the point. And I think since the gameplay is key there, the gameplay carries it. And I don't yeah. mind it. And, and, and then... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, and, and part of the reason I bring it up uh, in an art context is because I know for myself, um, a lot of times I've maybe delayed putting out a or, or finishing a design because I'm like, oh, this this design is not unique enough. Um, and I think Dark Souls is a good example of, hey, maybe you should put out the product or, or try to make something, even if it's if there's some designs that are a little bit weaker. Um, and they'll just gradually get better over time rather than polishing one until it's the perfect design, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. I'm using Dark Souls to push my philosophical arguments. <laughs> hey, David Dubois is in chat. Garth, oh, he's great. Out. <laughs> Here. Let me see. Uh, these these are just random screenshots from the Draftsman podcast. I, I don't I haven't posted them anywhere. They're just going to be on the screen. 
But what I want to do is have a little bit of fun with them and see if we can yeah. turn them into detectives. Wow. I'm Sherlock Holmes. I have never been more excited for anything in my entire life. <laughs> to be Marshall, to be a detective. Uh, detective. And if, it, if I can get it to a nice enough finish, I, maybe I could trick you guys into using it for a thumbnail. Nice. Uh, are, are you aware of Marshall's uh, noir, uh, 1920s, 1930s obsessions with uh, movies? You know, like detective mm -hmm. movies? No, I do, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's obsessed with that stuff. So. Perfect. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. He showed me uh, Double Indemnity, which is yeah. a classic yeah. noir film. Yeah. All about it. Is, is it uh, like a documentary kind of movie or is it? Is it? No, it's a, it's a drama. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting seeing movies from that time. They have a, a, such a distinctive style. And I, right. I definitely get why he likes it. Um, the acting is a little bit, uh, I will say, dated. And yeah. uh, maybe some of their social beliefs are a little <laughs> dated as well, but yeah. um, still a lot you can get out of that, especially in terms of the style and just the, the overall mood of the, the movies. Absolutely. So the thing I really liked, I, I, I've watched tons of those movies with Marshall and it's, um, I liked how um, DIY they felt, you know, yeah. how unprofessional. I mean, they, they were obviously very professional at the time, but they were, you know, just playing around with ideas and pumping tons of stuff out and, and it had to be such a distinct change from, um, you know, what what movies were doing. I feel like movies before that really didn't tackle that dark of subject matter. So even if the acting can be a little goofy, it's a pretty distinct change from where it was. Right. Yeah, and the absurdity of it too was, was <laughs> also really entertaining. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, Marshall's going to look great in that hat. Nice. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Stan, I think we have a clue. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, would you like a question? Sure, oh, yeah. Lay cool. it down. Okay, cool. Um, Joe Bogo asks, uh, do you have any mental health tips for someone that is tempor or temporarily unable to draw due to injury and uh, is getting anxious about it, uh, cannot cope with it because of his way of getting anxiety as well to draw. So I, I guess he, he draws to get rid of anxiety, but he can't draw because he, he has an injury. Oh, boy. Hmm. I have a suggestion regarding injury because uh, I injured my hand um, when I first started out. I was doing uh, construction. Not a fun job to do. Um, but I, had a, uh, I injured my right hand, and it wasn't uh, functional for a while. So I just switched over to the other hand for a while, even though it was a bit messier, but it just allowed me to continue. Um, so I'm not sure if that's an option, but maybe something, um, even if the work won't look as polished, you kind of, it might be a good exercise in, in um, allowing your expectations not to be too high. Uh, again, that really depends on what the injury is. But. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, not quite sure what the injury is, but... Um mental health things like to, to relieve the anxiety. My suggestion would be to write journal and, and ask yourself why you feel that way. Um, like anxious to get back. Do you feel behind? If so, why do you feel behind? Um, if you can find some kind of uh, th uh, therapist, they can do that online now. Um, I don't know. I, for me, what tends to help is, is uh, taking a step back, journaling, addressing the problem, writing why I feel the, or what, what it is that I feel so I can look at it on paper, whether it's insecurity or feeling, you know, uh, you know, behind or something. And then that way I can go through the feelings of it, sort of honor it and say, okay, that's there. It's legitimate. This is what I feel. Take a deep breath, get some coffee or something, come back to that page and say, okay, what can I do about it? Um, and what can't I do about it? And can I come to terms with that? So I don't know. I think, the more you equip yourself with that kind of, um, uh, I guess, it's a tool set for sure. Uh, the the better you'll be you'll be at kind of handling things like that from now on. So, right. yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, I think something that helps me for handling anxiety yeah. is exercise and eating well. It, it you know that's the stuff everyone says, and it doesn't seem like 
it's always good advice to just say, yeah, just go for a walk, you know, cause it's like, if you're feeling anxious, that's like the last thing you want to do, but mm. it, you know, getting outside and, um, you know, keeping your diet in mind can really help, help with that stuff. Right. Let's see. There's no shame in getting help. Let, let me yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I do it through BetterHelp, and uh, I think it's awesome. It's been really, really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, until they sponsor the Proco channel, we can't give them the shout out. I, I think they have actually. They, they've oh, done, okay. Yeah, that's so, so yeah, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is good. There you go. Go to BetterHelp. It's great. Uh, it's a great service. My yeah. therapist is sick. Yeah, I mean well, that in a positive. I hope, way. I hope they get better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's <laughs> good. Um, so I, I, uh, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time listening to Stephen Zapata's YouTube channel, actually, because I think he does a lot of videos on, um, uh, you know, anxiety and, you know, uh, this more spiritual side of art that is a lot of people don't necessarily talk about as much. Yeah. Um, uh, Sorry, what? Uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, Kamos says, uh, "Is it possible to get an art job right out of right after high school?" Yeah. Next question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me elaborate. Um, it's all about your portfolio and what you can provide for a project. Uh, you know, if your portfolio shows that you can do that, I don't see why not. Yeah, and there are plenty of people that get jobs in high school. You know, yeah. like. I know, I know of stories of, you know, um, I don't know, sophomore, sophomores in high school getting commissioned to work on big games just because they're, they're good enough, but obviously that's rare. It just, uh, all depends on your portfolio and your skill set. Um, what I would say is don't worry about getting a job after an art job after high school. I think it's, uh, you know, yeah, I think just focus on getting better or not even getting better focus on just expressing yourself with your art and uh just keep doing it I, I think over time you'll get better and naturally the the you have to think about it from an employer standpoint like if you are bringing something that uh if, if they see you as an asset then of course they're going to want to hire you so um if career if a career in art is like the main focus i'd say focus on making yourself an asset um it is a little bit of an oxymoron though where you kind of have to focus on doing art for yourself to get better. But then also by focusing on art for yourself, you end up being more employable. So it's kind of a strange, yeah, strange paradox. Yeah. Well, yeah, I also think a big part of being hired is your, you know, if you work well with the team and everything and yeah, for sure. Obviously your work has to be good enough, but it's a, uh... my, my mind jumps to someone like uh, Evan Amundsen, who's somebody who, um, really focused on making his own sort of world and uh, from chatting with him, like his own personal work and expressing himself has, has gotten him a lot more client work than anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I mean, it, it may seem like if you're in high school that there's a tremendous amount of pressure to go get an art job and, you know, make a living from that stuff. But, you know, if you're, you're in high school, you're, you're incredibly young you know, you have tons yeah. of time to figure that stuff out. Yeah. Yeah, that's super early. Just make sure that instead of going to art college, you take Ahmed's course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh my God. That's my well, I, um, I, oh yeah, take James's courses too. I, I think, well, oh, we, we can follow up that question with, do you guys believe in, in art school? You know, I think that's a- I love to plug in my non-proco stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Ahmed just, yeah, he released a new um, painting course. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so I do have some content on proco.com um, for online uh, stuff. It's a there are bundles that are based that are just um, my my older content kind of put together for cheaper than you'd find on my Gumroad. Uh, but I also recently released a um, digital painting course. Let me just move this aside. And there's been a lot of really fun things happening. I I gamified it. It's called Meds Map, and uh, we have yeah, that's me. It's so good. I, I kid you not. It's honestly one of the best programs that I like. It's so comprehensive. I find things in there that are helpful to me. Um, it's really, really good. Thanks, man. 
<laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. It's great. So I, t I took everything I learned from art school. So I'll answer the art school question in a moment. Um, and I kind of made a map, uh, a literal map uh, with, um, kind of, I wish I just opened the PSD of the map. But like every node is like all the fundamentals you need to be able to do paintings uh, the way I do. So we go over like everything. And if you go to the landing page, you can kind of see it. Uh, if you go to Med, if you just Google Meds Map or medsmap.mikejabi.com, and here's a the community page. People have been posting their work, um, and they're you know helping each other out and commenting. It's been really, it's been a fun experience. So, the point is to understand foundations, color theory, uh, form, shape design, all that stuff, so that you'll be able to draw and paint uh, concepts and all that all that you know, jazz. So back to the question of, uh, do I think art school is necessary? Uh, I think maybe 10 years ago, maybe, but right now with all these other options, such as like Proco, Schoolism, um, even Cube Brush, uh, my, my content, YouTube, like you, you can pretty much get everything you need online. However, the, the drawback is the lack of um, physical space and community that you get from an actual art school. And if, if that's important to you, then you could consider going to a school. But I don't know, I think I would have loved to just do a self-study with all the content in front of me. I learned a lot from like yeah. watching the Noman DVDs of Ian McKay back in the day. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit biased, uh, but I, I think that any sort of creative endeavor really needs to be a self-exploration. And the best you're going to get from another resource is just telling you what you need to learn. Um, yeah. I mean, and maybe some critique, but I, I don't know. I, I've done all of my art learning just on my own. Um, and I, I, I think with um, like when I, I learned guitar much younger um, and with that, it was helpful to have a one-on-one -on -one instructor. But even after, you know, once I, I got comfortable with the instrument, it was all about just self-exploration. And I think, and this is just my opinion, but I think when when you learn all these rules from from school and whatnot, you tend to get stuck in this very rule focused mindset, mm -hmm. and it sort of stifles exploration and experimentation. Right. So, um, not that those are bad, um, but I think uh, I see a lot of people get stuck at that sort of that stage where it's time to forget all those things that they've learned um, and really focus on just like experimenting and, and exploring their creativity. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, I think art school is incredibly expensive and, you know, it's just from a financial perspective, everything that they teach you is, is online for free or at a library, you know, for, for pretty cheap. And, um, uh, and yeah, I just don't want everybody to go into debt. Also. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. I, I think debt is, is a horrible thing that, you know, you should be very careful of if you're considering going into debt for, for school. Um, yeah, I had no student debt and it really allowed me to take a lot of risks financially with, uh, you know, starting the, the, the YouTube channel and it allows me to do a lot of like business endeavors that I wouldn't have been able to do had I been straddled with student debt. Right. right on. Yeah. Uh, when we were doing research to build the course and figure out the pricing, uh, cause I went to art center uh, and I also taught there, but I think a class, just just a class, it doesn't even have to be like, you know, uh, fundamentals class, but even if it's like history of art or modernism, something silly like that, um, it's like $4,000 per class, at least. And then CalArts is like around five. And that's absurd. Uh, if you're like a millionaire, sure, that's no problem. But um, I don't know. So based on that, we, we chose to make uh, the course more affordable at a fraction of that. And... Uh, it's the same content. And that's the thing. Like the, the same stuff I taught there, I was, I'm teaching online. Right. Uh, it just it doesn't make any sense to pay four, four to $5,000 well, for it. The, the, the strangest thing that I saw was that Marshall Vandruff was teaching at, you know, all these art schools for, you know, the same price as, as what you just said, three or $4,000 per class. But he was teaching at Fullerton college the community college for a couple hundred dollars per class and teaching the same exact mm -hmm. subject matter, you know, just yep. right down the street, essentially, and, you know, you, you can take a class with Marshall for, you know, a, a few hundred dollars at, um, uh, community college, um, for the same content. Yeah. For the, for the same exact content. Um, right. 
the, the, I, I guess the you know the argument the big argument that I hear to go to art school is that you have you know you can get connections to the industry if that's sure. what you're interested in doing. But I don't know. I, I everyone that I know that is a professional in the industry they either went to art school and then they met somebody at like an event they could have gone to without going to that art school or they got a job through Twitter or something, you know, right. it's never, you know, it, it's very rarely ever, you know, somebody they met at college that. Uh, really yeah. Really I also think um, while it obviously getting really good at art is challenging, that's why we're all following education uh, educators. Um, if you get good at art and post it, people will, you'll meet those people anyway. Um, so it's really a matter of whether or not the college is going to allow you to be good at art or not. And um, I personally believe you can do it outside of that framework so long as you um, make sure to manage some social connections with people and try to compensate for that lack of social connections. I'm sure it's hard to convince people's parents uh, <laughs> that they don't want to go to college, but... Right. Oh, and look who's here. Mr. Steven. Steven. Hey, Steven. Hey. Hey. I'm frozen. Yeah. What's I, up? I, I heard you guys dunking on art school, so I knew I had to join. Yeah. <laughs> hey, about how, much, how much you love art school, Steven. And, <laughs> you know, there's there is... the great Steven Zapata. Hi, everyone. How's it going? I just had to. Med invaded my stream, so I had to invade his. <laughs> That's the only way. But I'm a I'm a, I'm a dark red eye invader. I'm here to kill. That's why I'm oh, here. Oh, I'm here to steal insight. A, I didn't ring any bells. <laughs> no, trust me. Your your resident bell was ringing, and uh, I've been good to your uh, world. Yes, yes. How's your uh, How's your day going, man? Lovely, lovely. Just doing a little work, you know, in the planning stages for a picture. So doing some problem solving, okay. uh, and the usual, you know, running. I have a question. Um. We're all on the Proco channel, but Proco's not here. Uh, is this sort of like a fallout situation where Proco is Mr. House and uh, exactly. he actually doesn't exactly. exist? I'm actually Stan. I've had <gasps> uh, extreme uh, cosmetic surgery. <laughs> extreme. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, About as extreme as it gets, yeah. yeah. I've also increased my height. And I, I don't know about awesome. that because... Because on my stream, I saw, I think, you and Stan at the same time in one webcam feed. So yeah, um, that's a pretty well, elaborate yeah. trick. <laughs> it is pretty elaborate, yeah. I, do I, it with I, Photoshop and After Effects. We, we uh, took one of the other Proco employees and we genetically, or we, we put him through surgery to look like Stan. So, mm. Ah, there we go. I don't, I don't, it's pretty roundabout. So. Yeah, and and it all seems to it seems to be a lot of effort to achieve a very nebulous goal of confusing <laughs> artists. <laughs> there, there's no purpose to it. It was just for the stream, just to confuse you. Yeah. Well, it worked. It definitely worked. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, glad to have you here, man. Uh, Happy part, as always. I'm drawing Marshall and Stan as uh, Sherlock Holmes and Watson potentially. Nice. Uh, but I'm at a place where, well, I don't know which hat to give Stan. Do we want a light hat, brown hat, hmm. one of these, uh, one of these looking hats? Yeah, one of that's those looking man. hats. Whatever these. Those are called. Okay. Yeah, I think so. If you're going for the detective angle, I think that's a safe way to go. That's the good first read right there. <laughs> yeah. Can you give him a pipe too? Oh right, 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 right. So yeah. I'm gonna speak about your art for a moment. You're doing this cool thing I like where all of the shadows on the on the left side of Marshall's face look very grouped into one value. I know there's obviously variation in there in a core shadow, but mm. can you talk about how you're grouping those? Yeah, yeah. We can actually do some breakdown. So if you look at the reference, we can pull that into Photoshop, turn that to black and white real quick. Uh, you'll notice that all of all of the shadows are grouped together if you squint your eyes, and there's a separation and de delineation of dark shadow groups and light. And when you look at the light, it's only really a couple simple shapes. You got a triangle here, maybe a bigger triangle there, and, and so on and so forth. So if you can break down those value groups in a simple way, everything else will just fall into place. And you don't have to have as much detail in the shadows because you zoom out, well, you don't really look at the detail. If there's enough contrast to indicate it, you're good to go. Um, but most of the information should happen either 
on the core shadows areas or where light is actually hitting things to create visual activity and vibration and contrast. And when, let's say you're not using a reference and you're trying to draw it from imagination or a character of your own, uh, obviously understanding forms and stuff makes sense or it would help you come up with those shapes, but would you even take some of those shapes from your studies and references and just apply them to your own imagined character? Yeah. Sure. Like, let, let's say we're not going to use reference for Stan here. Uh, what we can do is lay in a, a value, which is we could just use the background color or this. And uh, I could say, you know, actually, before I even do that, I have to understand how shapes work. So regarding shape design, like, do we just do a big blob or do we have some kind of rhythm with um, shapes having some kind of gestural flow that connect everything? Uh, where we have big, medium, small in there, maybe some some breakaways of that. So if you can get shapes to look good as an abstraction, when you go to do your shadow shapes here, what I can do is um, even work in reverse. So if we just filled this all in and then made the, the light shapes have some kind of nice abstract quality, we could even actually just take this, pull that in, and put that on there, and it starts to kind of have some kind of uh, aesthetic that you can work with. And you can just fill in the blanks and uh, do something like that. Sorry, the I don't know if you can hear it, but there's like a lawnmower outside. It doesn't, it's not picking up. Okay. Uh, maybe another shadow here, shadow there. So on and so forth. And, you know, you tweak it for, until you think it looks good. Kind of looks goofy there, but uh, we don't have to put too much information in the shadows. He looks like a terrifying clown here. Um, <laughs> but well, yeah. I know from uh, watching one of your videos, uh, it, you, you did a similar thing with those um, the two characters that were in a tunnel. It was like a post-apocalyptic scene. Mm. And it was really cool to see how you just sort of abstractly laid in the light and then used things like perspective and whatnot to sort of actually map out how the shadows would go in real life. Sure. And yeah. It, it had such a better flow to it because you you didn't just think, oh, this is what would happen in real life and then go based on that. You went based on, I want cool shapes. And then you sort of reverse engineered how it would look in real life based on those abstract shapes. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, going forward with anything, a lot of us might want to have everything mapped out, fully controlled you you're controlling every moment of it but if you instead trust the random and see what happens and uh, not try to plan everything out almost like a dance like you never know you don't always know where where the song is going or what your body's going to do but if you just allow that randomness to kind of suggest something that you can play with kind of like a sandbox rather than trying to control the outcome of everything. Yeah, and I just want to chime in one more thing. Uh, somebody mentioned, this looks really easy. Is shading that easy? I do also want to say that you do then have to think about forms, how light would be obstructed. So there is perspective and in, in forms in that. It's just starting from a place of abstraction and then kind of working from there. Luckily, on my Meds Map digital painting course, <laughs> the very first assignment is forms. You see that alley-oop that I just did? Nice. Dude, you're, you're something else. Yeah, I just you want some props there else. just for James MVP right now. MVP thank right you, now. Thank you. Oh, wow. I love it. And oh, Christian, you, I got to send you this. I, I oh, yeah. With the... Hold on a second. What is Steven, how did you how did you get into my what is this? Not now. Not here. Oh gosh. Oh, luckily it's not loading. <laughs> oh, look at me. <laughs> oh man. Oh, why is it loading? Yeah. My my luck is is working right now. Oh dear lord! I did enough good things last week. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. If I, if I can just throw in a thought on the shape discussion that was going on here a little bit ago, oh. another another. Oh god! Now I have to shut up. All right, do whatever you're gonna do. Well, there's no audio coming through. Mm. Stephen, please don't shut up. I would like to hear what you're about to say. Oh, um, I was just gonna say that an, another thing that the kind of exercises that Med was talking about does is that it just builds your taste for the shapes that you actually like, right? Like, yeah. as you look at your references, I think most people don't actually gravitate towards every kind of shape in their references, right? Because a, a realistic reference of a real person, for example, tends to have square shapes, round shapes, 
amoeba-ish shapes and then sharp triangular shapes and things like that. And paying attention to their design in your references, I think you sort of naturally start getting an idea for what your personal preference is. And then you apply that filter to a lot mm -hmm. of other shapes as a shorthand. And then that makes it way easier to wing them out when you're drawing from imagination. Because yeah. instead of thinking about every kind of shape, you're always kind of going back to this, not a comfort zone, but like this, this filter that you put over all of the shapes where you're like, I like, a, I like to think of them all as vaguely triangular, for example, and then that's your basis. And it gives you a strong foundation when you uh, make them up and invent them. Definitely. I had something to add to it, but then it slipped my mind. Uh, so about instead I'll just say that. My course or something like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. That's what it was. That's what it um, was. I think I was going to say something along the lines of like, uh, yeah, it, it took me a while. Um, I think specifically from some of the demos you did, Med, to to realize like, it's a lot about selection and and editing out information or finding uh, shapes that you enjoy rather than just sort of looking at what's there and just sort of doing a one to one of right what's that's in front of you. Boring. Hmm. It's like a like a golfer's hat. Nice. There's got to be a very specific name for those. What are those actually? Sherlock hats. I'll look it up. I'll get, I got you. Find you want to guess what it is, Stephen? Uh, it's a Vomberborn. There, there's my guess. <laughs> <laughs> you just That's make right. that up. Of course, uh, I did. <laughs> a Vomberborn. Vomberborn. I love it. It's like a surprise. It is by called it. Open. It is called a deer stalker. That is the kind oh, of that. okay, that makes sense. Who right, would we'll, guess that? We'll, we'll give Stan a deer stalker. That's an insidious name. Jeez, it vegans is. will be very upset. <laughs> vegans hate it. This one <laughs> weird hat drives vegans crazy. <laughs> <laughs> one weird trick to drive vegans crazy. Now I'm reading the whole Wikipedia for this hat, which is like way longer than the Wikipedia for like <laughs> Renaissance artists. This is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Stephen, how are you doing? I didn't. Uh, I haven't spoken to you in a little bit. I'm good. I am good. I'm golden. Uh, Stephen and James, I do got to plan my New York trip very soon. Hopefully, after things settle down a bit, get some uh, uh, pizza with some mushroom toppings or something. Sounds good, yep. Sounds good to me, man. Yep. Sounds good to me. I'm looking forward to that. Thinking yeah, about we'll, it a lot. We'll get, get that, that going pizza. soon. Oh yes, yeah. absolutely necessary. Absolutely oh, necessary. I went to I went to Joe's Pizza in Times Square for the first time. When I was in New York, and I don't know I don't know how I lived without it before. Yeah, good reviews. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like dollar pizza, and it's like three feet long per slice. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've never had one. I've watched someone eat one, but I've never had it myself. Yeah, I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't recommend Times Square to anybody, but that's just because I'm yeah. from New York. So, yeah, yeah. and in good faith, recommend going to Times Square. But you know what? It is kind of cool if you've never been there. It's pretty. Uh, it's a great place to get mugged. It's one oh, of, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's one of it's the cool. one of the coolest places for that. Yeah, yeah, top five places to get mugged. <laughs> you walk away with a nice story. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, it's yeah, cool for minutes and then it gets pretty overwhelming yeah definitely no it is amazing i i, I think it, it gets a bad rap for uh people that are from here just because it's so crowded and a lot of uh muggings happen as i mentioned <laughs> right uh were you in new york city at all during quarantine yeah i've been here the whole time oh wow crazy i i live there towards like right after march so after the peak but I remember riding my bike a lot through Times Square and it being completely empty. I know. I know. Yeah, Manhattan has, has been pretty spooky. pretty spooky. Yeah. yeah, for someone who's lived in New York their whole life, it's like very, uh, very unsettling. It never yeah. looks the way that it did throughout this past, yeah. through peaks in this past year. It feels it's like wild. one of Med's post-apocalyptic environments. It's very scurry. Brooklyn has been like a... a continual block party though it's been pretty nice actually <laughs> that's yeah. nice yeah it's been it's been really pleasant yeah yeah should we take some um, questions uh yeah yeah you're this the streamer you tell us mm. 
Uh, James, your friend Ava Pelko keeps showing up in chat. I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> She's Sorry. so cool. Art's getting great. Uh, here, I'll, I'll read a question from uh, yes. the internet. Um, Honey Jade says, uh, how do you know when to stop working on a drawing or painting? I usually end up overworking my art because I just don't know when to let it be finished. But sometimes you lose a lot of its charm and, and energy. Question. Hmm. Well, uh, what was the quote? A, a painting is never finished, it's only abandoned. Was that Michelangelo or, or someone? That was uh, awesome. Let's say that. Yeah, it's like, because like uh, you get that question a lot where, you know, my sketch always looks nice, but once I start painting, it looks stiff and boring and I don't like it. And it just feels like a miserable rendering experience. I don't know, my, my, my mindset is like, I'm always sketching the whole time, even when I'm doing the painting, like those strokes that I'm doing, I'm letting them be painterly and sketchy so that I can enjoy it for myself. So. I don't know, I'd, I'd say find a balance and, you know, you should define what finished means to you. For me, like I might even say that this sketch of Marshall is finished and I, and I know a bunch of people might disagree and say, no, 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 it has to be absolutely 100% hyper real, photo real. And if it's not, then it's obviously garbage. Like, which I'd be like, well, you're entitled to your silly opinion, but it's just that. So I'd say define what, what finished is to you make a mood board of art that you love that you think is finished and then reverse engineer how to get to that right and uh if you find that that is where you want to get to like hyper rendered and all that and then and then you're losing that energy that you started with in terms of loose sketchiness or whatever uh then it might be that you have to find uh a way to level up the the rendering part for you this the the, the painting part uh to be more natural and energetic and that and that comes with studying art that embodies that um i don't know I'll let the others take over uh i'll throw in a thought here um so uh, yeah you can have all sorts of different opinions for when a picture is finished or what the necessary amount of resolve is but consider that maybe a picture is done whenever it has made its point right so whatever if you go in without an actual intent if you go in without a goal then you it's really easy to get funneled into just resolving every part of the picture ad nauseum because you're hoping to hit some abstract mark of if i've done this much work all over the picture hopefully now other people will think it's done right but really if your picture has a concrete goal like it's about this character or it's about this action or it's about this shape you can organize everything about the picture to enforce that right so Theoretically, if that moment in the picture is the highest contrast, the most interesting, has the most detailed shapes, if everything else in the picture is below that emphasis point in quality, resolve, anything like that, you have made your point and you can ship the picture at any moment and the thought is complete, the point is complete, whether it's sketchy, mid-level resolve or hyper render, right? That also opens the door to uh, a particular kind of working, like if you've ever painted over someone's stuff, um, you often find that there's pictures where you can actually finish them by deworking them because the, the emphasis point is fully finished, but they worked too much on everything else. And you can make the picture look done magically by deworking everything that's not the emphasis. So consider that there's also a, a weird finishing step that can be done in reverse instead. Yeah, I, I should have added something similar to that. Totally agree. In that if the statement is made, it's done. Mm -hmm. yeah. The hard part there is just what's your statement? You know, that that's yeah. always the tough part. I feel like that's the hardest part of art. I, I feel like that's art in general. It's, it's what's the statement. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if this is related, but Marshall once said something to me and I, you know, he's talked to me a lecture on art, you know, art business stuff. and. It was uh, the only ever the only reason to ever show your show your portfolio to somebody else is to incite greed. Um, and well, I, 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 what? 
Well, so the only reason to ever show your show your portfolio to somebody else is to incite greed. Like if you're showing your portfolio to somebody else, you're either seeking validation or you're wanting to show it to them to be hired by somebody to to make money. Ultimately, mm. it's on, it's ultimately you know, up to you to decide what the goal of the painting is. And if your goal is just to have fun painting, then the art is finished whenever you want it to be finished. Yeah. Um, if your goal is to be a professional illustrator at Riot or EA or something, um, you're leaving up, you know, what the art is to, to somebody else fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have anything to add, James? Or? Um, I'm going to refer to Steven's answer because it was so good. Um, and I like Marshall's answer about that as well. I actually don't have anything uh, to, I think, contribute any, any better or to make that any better. Um, I think it really is an arbitrary line and you kind of just have to decide. Um, and I think the point Med made about really consulting your references and seeing what level of finish people are bringing that to, because you know certain paintings might be looser than you think. They're just very decisive with what shapes are resolved and um, that makes them feel more finished than they really are. Um, oh, and one last point I'll make, which is uh, just because I've seen this whenever I've um, dealt with students' paintings and how to make them better. I, I think with digital painting, a lot of times people will go in there and make a really muddy mess with soft brushes, and then they struggle with, okay, how do I bring this to a finish? And all I ever do is when I when I critique that type of person, I'll go in with just 100% opacity and then just define some hard edges and really um, strong shape, uh, strong shapes. And that fixes the painting immediately. So I think part of it is um, having that confidence to one, make those bold marks and two, having the confidence to like actually decide what this is about and uh, decide that it's also going to be finished. Other than that, who cares about painting? Just draw. Yeah. <laughs> Paintings for nerds. Yeah. Jeez. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, let's see. Uh, let me find a question real quick. Um, the, well, the, the, this is a, a, a question that I've asked before on a different stream. But uh, so here, I have to think of it for a second. I'm just going to quickly refresh the browser uh, just because my camera was messed up. So oh, yeah, Sounds hopefully good. I can make it back in here. Cool. I get scared whenever Christian needs to think of a question. This it's, is going to be, it, this is, is going to burn. It's a very deep question. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 will, it will take a while to, to break this down. Um, uh, let's see. OK. so. Uh, for ten thousand dollars, you have to eat an entire jar of mayonnaise in one sitting. Do you do you do it? I'll do it for free. <laughs> I I knew Ahmed's answer. I knew Ahmed's answer. <laughs> that was an easy one. Dude, I, for, I thought you for those it. for those who have never spent any time around Med, he eats mayonnaise like you would never. No. Imagine. I mean, I'd put him up against a pig, like a six hundred oh, pound blue ribbon show hog. I the you watch him make a sandwich, you'll be horrified. It's like watching Saw or Hostel. Like you would never think someone could treat a piece of bread this way. And the poor jar, the way it's just left askew on the counter, mayonnaise dripping everywhere, spoon just filthily discarded over his shoulder. It's wild. It's absolutely wild. It's unreal. You'll never see anything like it. This is slander. Okay, this is not true. Can't be slander. Straight up fact. Straight it's up not... fact. Watch it happen every day. <laughs> Dude, being your roommate was a mistake. Watch it happen every um, day. No, I, I actually could not eat an entire jar of mayonnaise. I could, for 10,000, maybe. And it the would take some time. Yeah. But uh, I don't know why people don't like it. Uh, yeah, I, I do put a lot of mayo in my sandwiches whenever mm -hmm. I make them. <laughs> Yeah, you I used like to mayo. critique my sandwiches. You used to, I, see I, how I, much, <laughs> you used to see how much mayo I would put on my sandwiches, and you'd come up to me like I was asking for advice. You'd be like, "That's too much mayo you're gonna put on that." 
I, I, I just want to yeah, say I you, thought so. I just want to say the reference to the six hundred pound blue ribbon saw hog. Is that what you said? <laughs> show hog. What did you I say? Show hog. What did, what did you say? Uh, yeah, six hundred pound blue ribbon show hog. Yeah, show hog. There we go. There you go. I don't even know what that means, but it is such a specific reference, and it just made me laugh. <laughs> you know those uh, competitions where you dress up your pig and. <laughs> no, I'm not from a place that dresses up their pig in their free time. Dude, there's there's a what is it? Pig calling competitions. Have you guys seen that? Now, now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. Yeah, so at these pig fairs where there's going to be show hogs, there's a there's a segment where they're like, I, I can't even, I won't even do it. But they they make a bunch of pig sounds and like, go look it up. You won't regret it. All right, I'm all right. Watch it right now. <laughs> um, James, would you eat an entire jar of mayonnaise for ten thousand dollars? That's a really tough call. I um, I. I think I'm going to have to go with no. I kind of made a rule to myself that I don't want to do things that I don't want to do to make money. There you go. So I think I'm going to have to veto it. However, if the guy had $10,000 right in front of me, that might change my opinion. I don't know yet. Hmm. Hmm. So I'm very middle of the road on that. That is a fair answer. Even remember you used to put a... Uh... Sorry, I was watching hog calling on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you saw it, huh? I think I could win it. I think I could win that contest. Do you think Proko would ever put out a video on hog calling? Yeah, he would. Good. good. How, how are you going to teach art without it? All right, Med, you were going to ask me a question. Yeah, you, you you taught me some interesting sandwich making techniques. You would put potato chips in your mm -hmm. sandwiches. That's mm -hmm. delicious. I actually I, I agree with that. I also yeah. put uh, tortilla chips in my burritos. Great move. It adds some crunch whenever you bite into and it's, the burrito. And it saves a step. It saves a step. You're going to mix them up anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just more efficient. All right. Can I just say how about all food that you're eating is this, <laughs> you know, why, why skip the step? I mean, just skip it and just mix it all together, you know? Just put it right on top. Well, the sandwich is already layered, just unassociated things. You might as well. I'd put my Coke That's on there point. if I could. Can I just say how glad I am to have you guys all here instead of me just talking about shading or something? Yeah. Uh, who cares about art anyway, really, right? Yeah. Now that we have the keys to Proko's channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this is just a forum to talk about mayonnaise and, uh, and pig calling. Oh, everyone, there, there everyone must expect it by now. There is something I do want to address, um, which is there's been a meme in my channel that Proko and I are going to do a YouTube boxing match. Um, meme, that's reality. Uh, well, yeah, I think we're in a similar weight class, so um, maybe we could do a Jake Paul situation. And uh, let me call the fight. I would put in dibs on it. Let me call the fight. Don't let anyone else see the ring girl if you would like her and Stephen Zapata call that fight. I want to. I want to call the fight. I want to call the whole fight. Okay. Um. So I actually, I actually challenged Dan to a fight, and I learned. That he is a black belt. In oh the, no way! Yeah. Oh, I'm what? so going to lose. It, but it's it's like it's like a you know he got it when he was like sixteen. So I don't know. Oh, it doesn't oh, count. Okay. That doesn't count. I don't well, know. it still doesn't bode all. well for me though because I quit karate at six years old. So um, that's it's really my well. fighting experience. Yeah. Um, I, I would have to fight dirty. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's the only way. Um, I'm in. Well, that, I've that, used that's this the, platform that, for what I've the most important purpose is. Of yes, clearly. <laughs> yeah. That that's the only way you're ever going to get rid of that meme, James, is if you actually fight Stan. It would yeah. be uh, it would be funny if we did. Um, well, I don't know if it would be funny. It would probably just be sad. <laughs> I would love. To, yeah, <laughs> what if I wouldn't do it live? I'd edit it. That, that would be yeah, the way yeah, to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can add I sound effects. Mm -hmm. Do it with those. Um, those big like balloon sumo suits. Yeah. Be funny. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, you got to get like a real boxing ring. Hopefully one of the ones with the springy floors so that you guys can like throw each other down on it and you'll <laughs> yeah, back up in the air. That'd be super fun. Hey, Med, I'm going to switch this back to art momentarily, but yes. I want to talk about the way you're drawing those hands. I yes. noticed the back of the hand is very one value, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's some really cool looking 
shapes that remind me of either Sargent or Linedecker, but I'm an uncultured person, so I actually don't know. <laughs> well, I studied both of them for their hands. Probably this here is probably influenced more by Linedecker. But yeah, like um, grouping all this information as a shape and then uh, letting everything else just be the, the hot dog cylinder tube things that actually have the form rendering uh, the way you would render good old cylinders, right? Um, and then if you can get the form to read on those fingers, everything else will kind of uh, appear like it's in, in where it should be. Uh, I did a, the thing that helped me a lot with hands is like this 500 hand challenge that I did on my YouTube channel. And by the end of it, I, I learned a lot of little subtleties and patterns. You can find the knuckles at certain angles. And if you learn those shapes, like drawing hands just becomes so much easier. Yeah. I think the, the lessons I keep learning from, from drawing is it, it seems early on that just if you make something more detailed, it's going to be better. But uh, you just mm -hmm. keep finding ways to make it simpler and easier to draw, but also it looks better. It's kind of yeah, it's kind of exciting. That simplification is is kind of what opens up the door to style happening. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, if you think about it, if you just copy a photo one to one over and over again without any simplification or interpretation, uh, it'll just look like the photo. And exactly. So, Simplifying things, breaking things down, making shortcuts for yourself, put you in a place where people are going to be like, wait, how did you come up with that style? And you're just like, I don't know, I was lazy. I don't want to paint the whole thing. It's yeah, it's weird that way where it is, you do find these shortcuts, but it's those shortcuts that define the style and make it so that you can draw things much quicker. Right. Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was at the Hagen Museum in Stockton uh, this past weekend to see uh, some line decker paintings in person. and. Uh, the ones that stood out to me the most were the series of Kellogg kids that he did. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those, but seeing those in person is really strange because they're so simple. They're really just, you know, oh, yeah. it's extremely gestural and just, you know, it, it feels like he's he's drawing a painting pretty much. And that's awesome. Um, you know, it's it's cool to see, you know, his entire, you know, see like seeing those from far away on a computer or on, you know, just from far away in general, they, they look extremely complex, but when you get in close, the brush strokes are, you know, um, like, like no, he, I can tell he's not even thinking of drawing a, a hand or a face or something. He's thinking of the relationships and how they fit all together. Definitely. I know the piece fit. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't trust Lion Decker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, him, him and artists like him with like that super slick surface effect that everyone gets obsessed with never trusted them never do tell do I, explain i, I, I do the devil. to some degree but explain why you I, don't trust them okay well i i i think that it's i think that they were more into uh, projecting the surface and sort of being deceptive about what they were doing than we tend to think. I think that they really loved uh, that quality and the brand and like the brandiness of it. And they were definitely like hyper ingenious, right? Because even as far as um, Leyendecker goes, there's there seems to be good evidence from his letters that he purposefully kept his mediums a secret, right? Which we oh, all know. Okay. We all know that the tools aren't the thing, right? But it's weird at all to like tell people like, no, I won't tell you the mixture of my paint medium that I use to get the slick hatching, whatever. Whatever his intentions was, what really drives me crazy about it is that everyone takes it as sort of like low hanging fruit, the surface effect. Like there's so many people who try to copy Landecker, copy Sargent, anyone else with a really strong surface effect. And there's clearly way more going on there than anything that can be read on the surface, right? Because you know, basically to a person, no one can get Lay and Decker's look, right? Like everybody copies it and just tries to get the hatching. And we can all just tell they did the hatching and no one can make something that looks actually like a Lay and Decker. And it's like, if you compare them, um, he did everything else, right? That no one considers him for. Like he was super obsessive about his geometric designs. He did a lot of soft form modeling that you can yeah. see in the paintings, but everyone pretends isn't happening, right? Like if you if you got 
uh, if you could take some of the hatching out, sometimes I think that a lot of Land Decker's paintings would look like a like a dust and scratches pass on like a really strongly lit photo, but no one does that step first before they try to learn something from Leyen Decker. Yeah. They just go right to the hatching. So, I mean, I love them, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm overreacting. I do love them. I've copied them plenty of times, but um, I do wonder if I'm, I act, as someone to like learn from and things like that, he actually drives me kind of crazy. I feel like I never see anybody can learn you, super Can you elaborate on what you mean by the surface effect? Do you mean like you're not seeing the the underpainting at all? Do you mean you're not seeing the rendered form? I think you refer to rendering the form. So I was just like a yeah. little, wanted a little more clarification. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like Landecker, in Landecker's uh, case, it's specifically the hatching, right? That's what everyone, okay. when everyone thinks, and I'm including in that like the really crisp shape design that he does as well, because when, um, when Landecker has like a triangular, uh, highlight on a cheekbone or something like that, he flicks it off as like one hatch mark, right? One actual brush stroke of the painting. But he also does the thing where he's ignoring the form underneath and he's just doing like uniform diagonal hatching with the paint, okay. right? It's all, yeah. and he's super judicious about it, right? You can tell that he's really precise and planning it really carefully yes. because he it's all perfectly evenly spaced. It's all the exact <laughs> same angle. Um, and it's almost always all of that stuff is happening over his more, much more academic, much less flashy uh, form modeling and okay. form design, yeah. right? Um, and no one holds on to that stuff. And that kind of drives me a little bit crazy because we don't, we have very, even his studies, even the studies we can find, there's almost none that have the underpainting. And if you actually yeah. look at Landecker's paintings, you can see he did real underpaintings. There's no other way to get the soft form modeling under the hatching. It's almost like the only studies you can find are the ones where he did the underpainting and then he looked left and right. He were like, people are still gonna buy this one. And he did the hatching on them, which is, that's a little weird to me. That drives me kind of crazy. All right, I'm gonna shut up about Landecker now. That's all right, that's all right. This is someone. an art stream. We're, we're discussing artists, it's good. Um, before I zoom into these Landecker studies, I just wanna point out the, that hint drop that you read Landecker's letters, you weirdo. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of crazy. They're in all of his books. All the books about him have some of his letters in there. No one reads the words in art book, Stephen. Only Who reads one. anyway. Like that's that's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He does all these. Like to us, those are like you could make finished paintings with those. But for him, it was just a study for the bigger painting, and a lot of these Landecker pieces. Yeah, the thing that is most surprising to me about Landecker is just his body of work. He's, he did so many paintings, like so many amazing paintings when he was alive. Awesome. Like incredible amount of work. Yeah, I, I kind of want to get back to oils sometime soon. Do it. Do it. That'd be really cool. And then you can come on here um, and do an oil painting demo. Yeah. Nice. Show the world how it's done. There you go. That's cool. Mm. Do a... Uh, Either of you oil paint, Stephen or James? Um, I, I used to, but it's been a long time. Yeah. I hesitate to say that I do it. I do dabble, um, and I can do some figure paintings, but I am I am now 100% weeb, and I just make anime. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen has this really cool oh, easel shit. that he would take on uh, well, paintcations, go up north to San Fran or something, and come back with these cool paintings. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do a, a bit of plein air back in the day. And after that, I started doing that in like gouache, watercolor, and casing on trips. Weren't you like on one of those trips and there was like a dude who put you on a boat and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. A lot of, it, a lot of interesting stuff happens if you just sort of uh, <laughs> drive up the coast and uh, let whatever is going to happen happen. Hey, you want to go on a boat ride with my dog? And you're not going to say no to that. You're not going to say no to that. <laughs> Can you elaborate on who this is and how this happened? Uh, yeah, I was. Where was I? I was in Morro Bay uh, on the California coast, uh, which has a really famous, uh, like a volcanic funnel rock. It just looks like a perfect, almost like a perfect half hemisphere just jutting out of the water with no transitional elements between it and the water. It's a super cool rock. If you type in Morro Rock online, you'll see it. But I was hanging around there for a few days, painting the rock, painting some of the uh, coastline around it. And it's a 
it's a bay, so there's a lot of boats there. So uh, around lunchtime one day, I posted up, I picked a boat and I was doing a plein air of one of the boats. And I don't know, I'd only been painting for like 30 minutes before a guy just kind of came up to me, you know, older guy, uh, kind of a slow gait. Uh, he had just parked his truck back there. And he's like, oh, that's coming out really nice, well, you know, which is usual. And I was like, oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I appreciate it. Are you from around here? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's my boat, actually. And I was like, no way. And then I, at first I thought he was kind of like scamming me or something. Like that. He's like, no, no, come on. You should check it out. So I wound up going on the boat with him, meeting his dog. Um, I helped him lift some heavy stuff out of his truck. And then before long, he was like, you know what? You're cool. You should get on this tiny boat with me. And uh, my dog will come on and I'll take you around the bay and show you some stuff. And I was like, sure. <laughs> And then, you know, I thought you didn't this think that was crazy that this random person just wanted you, to take you on a boat. Dude, you know, what's funny is that when I started telling this story, I was like, man, this story is way, way, this is the boring story. Why am I telling this? And now I just remembered when we got out to the middle of the water, I started asking him more about his life. And yeah. He was like, yeah, I used to be a Navy SEAL. I was the guy who committed the assassination in the Bay of Cuba of oh that uh, guy from this country. Yeah. So I was a ballistics expert. I would plant underwater bombs on boats. Uh, he started telling me all these crazy stories. To this day, I don't, my gut reaction on that little <laughs> boat was like, this guy's gotta be lying. This can't be real. He was telling me like the wildest stories. I still have no yeah. idea, but uh, yeah, that freaked me out of it. He was cool though. He was cool. <laughs> Would you recommend to people to go on strangers boats, Steven? Nothing bad happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I the opposite answer but <laughs> i think it's good to I, I like the pleasantries of talking to random people i mean maybe in new york they don't like it so much and i annoy people but um i think taking it to the level that steven has uh where you are now going out into into the bay on a stranger's boat i feel like once boats are involved it's not a good idea I, I, I did not feel scared until, you, honestly, the boat thing was fine. Well, I got scared once he was like, yeah, I'm an expert at blowing up boats. I was like, all right, now I feel a little uncomfortable. Now I feel oh a little uncomfortable. Did, did he at least have a cute dog? Oh, the dog was adorable. Uh, it was one of those dogs that's like been, it was a big uh, Labrador. It was like an older one. I forgot her name. She was like eight years old, but uh, she was totally relaxed on the boat. She like just jumped right on to the little motorboat, sat on the prow. You would have thought she was just like sitting on the on the couch in the living room as we were doing like 40 going along in the She's bay. Like, That's what it is. Just looking around. Oh yeah, that dog's seen some seen some stuff. <laughs> yeah. He had like a little scuba suit for the dog and like he no. had its own bomb kit and the dog would plant bombs on the boat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. My favorite um, piece of art I've done in a long time. I love it so far. It's looking really great. And people in the chat were surprised that pro artists use references. Ooh. No, Ooh. wow. Pro artists, dumb <laughs> I didn't. I didn't mean that to to oh, um, okay. to har harass the person. I meant, um, can you talk about like in your professional work how you have to use references and how that's like? Uh, there, yeah, I mean, I know it gets. Sort of covered a lot it's just people uh, really stress out about it it is weird that people stress out about it like wh who's where's the source like who's like Jing, Kim Jong shaming everyone for using reference like i want to sit down and talk with these people and be like what's wrong with you man uh yeah if you sit there and try to invent absolutely everything that it's just you could do that cool congrats you might get a round of applause um but like why you know if, if you if you're like born on an island and you've never seen what a car is and someone tells you to draw a car, you have to look at a car. You have to understand how it works. You have to study it. You have to look at the reference, you know, deconstruct it. Um, and someone might say, well, we'll look at Kim Jong-un. He doesn't use reference. The man is spent his whole lifetime studying things and updating his mental library. And he spends mornings looking at things first before going and uh, drawing something. So, this whole like romantic fantasy idea that a real, true, amazing artist never ever uses reference. It's, it's such a pointless thing to put forth. Like an artist, the, the, the purpose of an artist is I think the universe exists in the external world from where you're standing. The universe provi provides you with data, light objects, 3D objects, information, stories, emotions. You're an artist, you interpret those things. 
Now, if you're if you're gonna say no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want any input from the universe. I want to make everything up because I'm so cool and special. I don't know. I don't, you can be I, Jackson Pollock. Yeah, that's cool. Even that. Well, that that's him taking his experience from the universe and and putting it on the canvas. That, that's I yeah. know that's not using reference, but um, yeah, yeah. It, it's like all the all the great masters, as David Dubois is saying they used live models. They had drapes on mannequins when the model wasn't there so they can get the exact, uh, not the exact, but like an indication of the, the highlight, the reflection, the material. But again, the fantasy of, well, if I use reference, people will make fun of me on Instagram. Wh what? I, th I think there is a legitimate concern though. Like um, I'll give you an example. When uh, Steven, to refer to you, like when we watch, if you watch, someone watches you draw, you pull a lot of that stuff at just straight out of your head and it's not relying on um, any information, but it takes, I'm assuming an, over a decade of practice to be able to do that. And I remember you did the, the video on my channel and at the live event talking about sort of how you got into the, you worked your way into pulling images directly from your head. Mm -hmm. Cause there is a desire to do that. Like it is fun to just sit on the couch and have a sketchbook and, have no other input other than your your brain. And I think sure. um, I'm noticing now with storyboards that if I can just sort of imagine the poses and don't have to keep looking at a reference each time I need a new pose, it, there is a benefit to it. So I think sure, yeah. there, in some instances, there are legitimate reasons to want to not use reference, but I think it's false to think that there are no, or that you can get there without it. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think it, because it's all process. It's just it's just everything's validated by process. If you need imagination for this part, great. And if you need reference for this part, great. It's only a problem when it becomes dogma, when it's like you should yeah, never yes. use reference or always do everything from imagination. Because even speaking for myself personally, like, yeah, I it is a big part of my process to experience the joy of pulling things out of my head, right? And a lot of the times I am drawing things that don't have necessarily a, a realistic analog but 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 looking at that from the outside you might think that that's good enough for me right but most of the time it's not i just have a yeah. higher benchmark in my head for what i wish forms look like so my process actually more looks like i take a stab at it i do a bunch of those drawings you know i do my best but my standards are just even higher so then after yeah. that i will use what i drew as a starting point and i'll be like all right what what a uh, what like part of a horse looks kind of like this where if i take a second pass i can have a more solid reference for it. or i'll go make mm -hmm. my own reference right like zbrush is super helpful for me in that regard uh, if i if i'm unsatisfied with the resolve on something that i pulled out of my head i'll go and i'll spend a day making a maquette of it i'll sculpt it as best i can in 3d or in clay yeah. and then i'll and then i'll use that as the basis for a second half for a second pass but mm -hmm. yeah maybe the sculpture is the, then it's like it's a snake biting its own tail thing right because the sculpture is referencing my drawing yeah the sculpture is technically out of my head but form is happening for free like you know there's, there's um there's this magic the gathering artist who goes by the name uh victor adame that's his name i don't know why i said it that way um but he creates these pretty intricate maquettes and then simulates the exact lighting scenario and it turns out beautifully in his uh, paintings. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think something that was pretty revelatory in the, the, the video you did on my channel was how you sort of worked into the process of drawing from your imagination. You said you would take the little stick figures from the bathroom, like the, the boy girl stick oh, yeah. figures, and you would yeah. just pose them over and over again, which is such a, a smart way to do that because you you've, lowered the bar in terms of anatomy and, and making it accurate. And now you're solely focusing on imagination, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like when you go to the gym, you're not working out legs and biceps at the same exact time. You're not doing like leg yeah. curls and working out biceps. You're just isolating exactly that part, which mm -hmm. is I'm isolating imagination. And for me, that was honestly the cure to figuring out how to uh, draw from imagination. Great. Right. It's an ad. Uh, <clears throat> Please add. Follow up. I, I do get riled up with that question, uh, as you can tell by my response. <laughs> I, I understand. That's that. not. That's not to say I don't like drawing without mm -hmm. reference. I love grabbing a sketchbook and making up characters and and all that. 
Um, but like you said, it takes time to build up the ability to do that without reference. And and I'm I'm just empathizing with the the student mentality of somebody starting out and then hearing like weird myths about the do's and don'ts of art. And like you said, if, if once it becomes dogmatic, then there's a problem. Yeah. Like, I think I think if I gave you an assignment saying, hey, draw this skull once from reference and then draw it again without reference. Right there I'm saying don't use reference because you learn something from that. But that's not to say that everything must be that way. Yes. It's yep. that's that's true. It, it being dogmatic about it is really the issue there. And I, I think for people that are trying to work on that skill, there are some really practical solutions that you can do. The one that uh, the exercise that I just mentioned about Steven. Um, one thing that I like to do, which is sort of like in easy mode, because it's not really imagination. Um, I'll take reference poses and then I'll apply my own characters to them. So it's kind of like an easier mode of coming up with those poses or, or sorry, like drawing your in your own style and having your own characters. But now the poses are um, a little more dynamic maybe because you're using cool reference for it. Right. And uh, yeah, there's just like little practical steps you can do rather than going at it, sitting in your sketchbook and you're like, oh, well, my, you know, you keep trying to draw from imagination and then your figures don't look like anything. Um, it's because you're, you're trying to tackle too many things at once. Maybe you're trying to do anatomy and all these really, really difficult steps. <laughs> I don't know if you saw what I was doing there, but... Uh... No, I didn't see it. I think James was actually trying to be helpful while you were was, goofing around, okay. Ned. I was, as you were talking, it made it look like a stand <laughs> arm. Like, and then there's this thing, and then... <laughs> all right, anyway. I'm sad I missed it, I'm sad. You know who loves when you do stuff like that? Art directors, when you waste their time when they're at your desk by oh. doing little Photoshop jokes for them. They go, ha ha ha, can we please get back to work? I'm very stressed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> still do it though all these years later i can't help it it's just okay. funny still do it still working with them by the way uh i think yeah. so yeah oh, God. um to, to add something to the reference thing i i all the professionals that i know that work at studios or movie studios or any of that stuff they, they tell me that you know something like 60 to 70 percent of their process is looking for reference and doing research you know it's almost none of it is the actual drawing and um you know it, it, even you know, no, no matter who you are, especially in a concept art position, the goal is to share ideas, not necessarily make pretty art, even though pretty art yeah. is obviously a big part of the process. But. Yeah. Watch the video on Med's channel with uh, Thomas Chamberlain, and then you'll go, oh, okay, I get it. Oh, yeah. All right. Do, uh, do you guys know uh, not, uh, Donato Giancola, the painter? Of course. I actually, does the mermaids and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's awesome. Um, he, he, has a, he has a video where he goes through a an illustration of Joan of Arc and he goes through the entire process of him um, putting models together and then shooting reference and then taking that reference and essentially doing the painting in photo, like composing the painting in Photoshop and then printing out that reference and then essentially painting from the photo. Oh, cool. Doesn't Stan um, do that or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah Stan does that and uh, Morgan Weisling does that and Jeremy Lipkin. Yeah. Do whatever it takes. Yeah. We'll just do whatever it takes. You know, it's like a like Lipting or Morgan Weisling will go and you know they'll you know they'll they'll go in and you know spend a ton of time getting the right belt buckle that would be on a cowboy's belt or something or yeah or holster or pocket or any of that kind of stuff. And they they'll actually go and buy that. So in their reference, they're not doing any of the work. Um, all they're like like pretty much every everything that's difficult is finished. They just need to paint the picture. Yeah. <laughs> Is the, this kind of, it, it's like, it's about the art, right? Yeah. It's about the art. There's this weird thing with students these days where people forgot that and people think it's about them. It's like a lot of weird <laughs> ego stuff where it's like, I have to be a good artist. I have to be a badass artist. I have to be able to be this kind of artist. Is the art good? Like yeah, focus yeah, yeah. on the piece, right? Do whatever it takes to make the piece good on its own merits and then worry about yourself after that. I, I think I think somebody asked during your stream um, about uh -oh. Cal sketchbooks. <laughs> Detective uh, Stan, welcome. Detective Stan is here. What's up, guys? Hey. hey. 
How wow. are you, Stan? Wait, do I'm doing down? well. Keep keep talking. Sorry. <laughs> so so we, were, we were talking about something bad. similar to um, what you hear. You're bad. Oh yeah. Right. Sorry. We were talking about the the reference dilemma, um, oh. and we were talking about maybe certain ways that uh, you could sort of overcome that hump of not using re or uh, of drawing from imagination. Oh, and, geez, I um, walked in the wrong moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I was actually just about to refer to that. Um, I don't know if it was your latest Draftsman episode, but you and Marshall talked about that and kind of covered it pretty thoroughly. Um, yeah, I don't know which one you're talking about, but it seems like that it, that topic comes up like every day for me. So Yeah, understandable. <laughs> it's all a blur. <laughs> um, do you know what that episode is called? I actually, I don't. I, I yeah, leave it just yeah. on in YouTube yeah. in the background. Yeah, um, that's cool. Boxing uh, match. Boxing. Sketchbooks is the name of the episode, Stan. Sketchbooks? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I see a lot of videos on YouTube, like these CalArt sketchbook tours that are like these incredible, like every single piece Dude. of art is just incredible, right? And I think that that's like not indicative of what sketchbooks are actually meant to be. They're meant to be yeah. these like just playful, bad drawings, scribbles, and nice drawings. Like you're just experimenting with stuff. And, Definitely. I think that's a lot to like, give students the impression that you have to have pretty drawings for everything. Well, these uh, sketchbook tours, are they meant to be like portfolio pieces that these students show gallery or not galleries, the studios? And they're like, look at my sketchbook. It's like my portfolio. Or well, some of the uh, called, like, YouTubers. I, I got into X art school with this sketchbook or, you know, uh -huh. you know, the, like that kind of stuff. And I, I think those are the fine, but huh. Um, Oh, well, then if they got in with the sketchbook, that means it's their portfolio. It's not their sketchbook. Yeah. Right, right. It's a filter. <laughs> they they, a they put together their best sketches and it's their portfolio. That's totally different. I think right. there actually is some, some nuance here because I think it depends what kind of artist you are because there, there tends to be an artist whose primary focus is, can I make a beautiful picture? Right. And they will prioritize that over anything else. And then there's other kinds of artists who are trying to solve a problem. Right. And so let's say maybe um, someone who paints a very similar painting over and over again. Right. Like, let's say that, you know, one of your paintings is it's always a beautiful woman in some sort of natural environment with sunset lighting. Right. That could easily be the brand of a super high class oil painter, right? And they're mm. solving a similar problem every time, right? It's not the it's not the identical problem every time, but it's a very similar problem. So we might say that making the beautiful picture for that kind of artist is the number one priority. But then there's someone maybe like a, a designer more on the designer side, right? It's a very unique problem every time, right? It might be an environment this time, a character this time. The characters are of completely different archetypes, right? Child, adult, um, rich, poor. That's a, an artist who's interested in those things has a much longer problem solving process to go through a lot of the time than someone whose priority is make a stunning picture, right? Both are valid, but they have different ramps of problem solving. So actually I think for the first kind of artist, beautiful sketchbook kind of makes perfect sense because beauty is tantamount or right? like paramount, right? It's number one. Um, and I, I don't see any reason why having beautiful sketches in a sketchbook would not make sense. Whereas for a problem solver, who's really trying to break apart things that they're even not very familiar with every time they solve a problem, I think there, yeah, dirty sketchbook is almost a necessity. You know, because you're you're like, I've never yeah. drawn a reptile before. Why am I going to waste time trying to draw a beautiful reptile? I don't know what makes something a reptile, right? So I think there's <laughs> some nuance there. Yeah, thanks for not using kangaroos as an example there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I'd been Appreciate thinking it. fast enough, I would. You're the one that brought it up. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I it, it's better if it's me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Med, can I ask you a quick question about the process? And again, I'm I'm asking leading questions. But you did something where you created a layer that was dark, and then you took this took a soft eraser and then erased away. Yeah. What type of shadow is that called? Ambient occlusion. Uh, so we can do it over here under Stan's beautiful hat. Uh, what I like to do is make a new layer, fill in all this area, use an airbrush eraser, and go upwards into it. It has a nice little ambient occlusion effect. It looks real nice. Oh, no, Marigato. 
Yeah, just wow. wanted to call that out. Call it. <laughs> yeah, 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 I saw that too. That was cool. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Um, Stan, we discussed that you were, in fact, a black belt earlier. <laughs> God, Christian, what the hell? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, my, my YouTube is audience is trying to get us to do a Floyd Mayweather, Logan Paul thing. <laughs> Which one of us is Mayweather? Uh, uh, I'm going to go with you. You're the black Paul? belt. Uh, so, sure. Well, so I, I'm not I, I sure. Think, yeah, but, but we, I was like, how old was I when I got the black belt? Christian said 16, but I, no, I will let you know no, that no, no, I quit no, no, no. karate at five years old. So um, <laughs> you quit yeah. at five. When, when did you start? At five. <laughs> at five. Okay. No, I think I was, I got the black belt when I was like 12 or 13. So okay. obviously I, I was not a real black belt, right? <laughs> like, like what 12 or 13 year old is a black belt? <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe it's you like you were a, a ninja prodigy. No, no. It's just one of those places where you go and you pay for a, a black belt test. Oh, or you, okay, well, okay. you pay. It's like every two or three months or whatever, you have your next test. It's like, oh, you're going for purple this time. And then okay, everyone yeah, gets yeah. it. As long as you pay for it, you'll, you're going to pass the test unless you really mess up um, and you don't show up. But, you know, every kid got it. <laughs> Every kid got it. And then, by, you know, two years later, you're a black belt. You know, it wasn't easy. Like, as a, yeah. as a kid who wants to just go have fun with, with his friends, like, it's still difficult to do that. But, you know, that's not a real black belt. <laughs> but then I did get to brown belt and, a, and a, like, a real karate place. And our uh -oh. sensei was on the Japanese karate team for, like, a decade. So oh, he, awesome. he, he, like, beat us up all the time. It was, oh, it was brutal. It was yeah. real. But... I, I didn't get a black belt in that one. I got a brown belt. I, okay. I had to choose because I was a, a junior in high school when I was, he told me I need to start training for my black belt. And I was like, but I like drawing. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, you got to come in for like three hours every day because you're not going to get your black belt unless you take yeah. it seriously. And I was like, nah, <laughs> <It's a fair laughs> I'd rather draw enough. three hours every day. <laughs> so I went that route. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, brown yeah, belt is way more than what James has, so. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot to work with, so. I don't cool. know, though. <laughs> then then let's do it. <laughs> All right, there we go. We'll sell the cool. tickets nice. um, at 200 bucks <laughs> a pop. It's going down. Oh, this is the best day this of my be life. So, it will be very depressing. Watch uh, out, Stan. I've seen, I've gone to a rock climbing gym with James and seen him hang yeah. upside down from walls. Some crazy yeah. muscles that even you don't know are in there start popping I'm out sure. right <laughs> here. It's some scary really? stuff. You're going to get oh, freaked. Oh, I think bro. I'm going to bet against wild, myself bro. and throw the fight. I don't know. Yeah. No, I've gotten a dad bod since then. So I, I've got <laughs> nothing to work with. <laughs> it sounds like this will be a very depressing fight. <laughs> It'll probably be very, I don't, very I don't entertaining. Think I, I don't think anyone was hoping for a technical battle between the two of you. People just want to see you guys brutalize each other. That's it. We're pulling hair, scratching yeah. each other. That's what oh, people man. want. That'll yeah. go viral. That's what'll go viral. Um, Proko, I am sorry for using your platform for this, but it's it's just been it's been ongoing, and I can't get my 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 live stream chat to stop talking about it. So I needed to bring it up. Yeah. Oh, this the fighting thing. This specific yes, this specific thing. Oh, okay. And they're yeah cool. they're Thanks. they're insistent about everything once they get an idea in their head when As, did they get this idea so like i right don't know now, I, when no Christian no this has been going on for i think I, I have been live streaming pretty much every weekday since january so uh but why fighting i don't why i don't know i don't <laughs> i have no idea how things develop okay. um the masses also, want blood that's all it is okay. med and steven can attest that my audience is very strange are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Yeah, everyone in James's chat is just full of bloodlust, mm. wants suffering. They want to see sacrifices. They just want to. See, they want to see everything burn. That's all they Especially want. Especially Will. Yeah. Hmm. They are. Yeah. We we have some very peculiar characters that go in there, um, and uh, we've had them come on voice chat at times. So their 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 opinions are expressed. It's chaos oh, over yeah. there. It it is. <laughs> Wow, I want to see this. So someone went on voice chat and was talking about how we need to fight. Well, because I, I did a, um, I think we were talking about um, YouTuber boxing matches because I was mm. watching the the Jake Paul one that happened. So 
Yeah. Or we were talking about the trend of that because it seems like all the YouTubers and um, D list celebrities are trying to throw their hat in the ring, so to speak. Yeah. Um, Who else? I mean, I, I know Jake um, Paul has been doing Jake has Paul. Been like uh, there's one with punch, Aaron but... Carter. If you're a fan of his, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I know who he is, but now, yeah, are you a fan uh, of his besides like? Uh... <laughs> okay. Um, no. Let's I like see. different, different type of music, <laughs> but it, it just, yeah, it keeps, uh, there's a bunch of them that keep happening. Um, they're just probably lower on the, uh, totem pole of, of YouTube boxing mat or of boxing matches. Anyway, okay. it's not important. <laughs> Med, who do you want to fight? Med, who do you want to punch in the face? I was gonna say He's going to go against you. Oh, Med would. Would you guys yeah. are the opening card. I've, I'm not a violent person. Um, I've only been violent once and it was actually against Steven Zapata. I'm not gonna... <laughs> this is a story that will not be told. I cannot <laughs> say the full details of the story, but I was friendships angry. Are, friendships are complicated. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask about the, the painting because that seems more relevant to the live stream. Um, okay. Let's leave them uh, hanging. Sure. Where, did, uh, where did that idea or what are you doing with your hatching in the background there? Oh, uh, I mean, the first thing I, is I wanted to get that nice contraposto, not contraposto, yeah, uh, simultaneous contrast effect of having, uh, you know, the background being bright against the shadow and then dark against the uh, the highlight, which I haven't made the background dark, to get the subject to pop. But then yeah. um, in terms of like the hatching and the style of it, it was really just out of, you know, I had that brush open. I yep. could easily just make an airbrush thing, but... I think the hatch goes along nicely with the brush strokes of, of the of the painting. So, the the reason why I'm bringing it up is because like you have all those brush strokes behind uh, Stan and Marshall, and you could have chosen to do them horizontally, 45 degree angles. Oh, but they're okay. all vertical, right? There's like there there's a clear logic of I'm going to do a bunch of vertical brush strokes to sort of sure. paint away that. Yeah, yeah. So the the reason is uh, what I've discovered throughout shape design studies and composition studies is whenever you have uh, lines or, or curves or C-curves, X-curves that are going diagonally like this, like that, making Xs, going this, this is the way and that way, it creates a nice kind of flow. The mm -hmm. moment you have something vertical, it, it kind of stops things, stops that movement, right? But if I had, um, you know, the background being all diagonal, it would for me, take all the dynamic attention away from the uh, the characters. So okay. this way, what we can do is emphasize the dynamic angles that we used for all the faces to contrast against the verticality. Uh, same thing with like horizontals. Any perfect horizontals or verticals will tend to make things feel static, uh, but then contrasting against it with the dynamics. Awesome. You know and the um, you mentioned simultaneous contrast, uh, and you kind of glossed over it. And can you just like, point out a little bit more specifically where that's happening. Right, I remember you brought that up to me and uh, the way you described it. Oh, really oh good. boy. I'll take a break <laughs> right, for this one. I've heard this for years. Jeez. <laughs> Sorry. I was <laughs> obsessed with trying to understand simultaneous contrast. Uh, <laughs> as Steven <laughs> leaves. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Steven. Uh, basically, uh, the, the way to break it down is if you have a, a gradient, uh, it's essentially a checkerboard, but if you have a, let's just fill that in, perfect gradient like this, uh, at the very foundation of it, 50% gray, right in the middle. If you take that value, sure, it's fine. It's just chilling there. Over here, that value looks really dark. Over here, that same exact value looks really bright. So in a way, it's simultane simultaneously contrasting against both if you make a bar go across the whole thing. There's a nice little popping effect that happens there. So if you take that concept and take it a little bit further by emphasizing the contrast on those sides, so you would take black and put it here. Oh, let's lock that. Black and white. Now it really pops as a nice optical illusion effect. And so essentially what's happening is you have a checkerboard of area that's dark, area that's light against dark and light, dark and light. So what I'm doing in a, in a more subtle way here is that 
you have a dark side of a sphere and a light side of a sphere. You can kind of blend that. And behind that, it's going to be bright and then dark. And you can keep alternating vertically, horizontally, yeah. so on and so forth. And uh, if you were to render that to its fullest, then it would have that popping effect, right? So that's that. Now, do you explain this all the time? Because um, I just noticed in the chat, everybody said, here he goes again. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's why I walked away. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that this was such a recurring problem. But I still think it's a great concept for people to learn if they've never heard it before. Yeah, it's very common in like a lot of master paintings and, and yes, yes. old school things. Uh, there's a specific piece by Jamie Jones that I saw him do this in. And I'm like, how is he getting it to pop? And if I could recreate it, because I couldn't find the actual painting. But there was a uh, Who's scene, the artist? Uh, Jamie Jones, okay. a, a concept artist, um, where there was like a sunlight or some kind of bright cloud uh, formation. And in front of that, uh, there was like a cloud that was over the light part, but also over the dark part, but it was popping out. And then I realized that he made that work by making this part of the cloud brighter and gradates against it. And then it creates that optical illusion effect when you zoom out. And so ever since I saw that in the painting, I became obsessed. And so that's why they make fun of me in the chat for it. Um, yes, it's so fun. to it's, it's really fun to play with once you get the hang of it. Yeah. J James Gurney has a formulation of it as well called the, mm -hmm. uh, the windmill principle. So mm -hmm. he takes it to... Um, uh, he applies it more to the whole composition. I, I think if I remember correctly, he's like, does the composition have a moment where uh, the main element has light on dark, dark on light, light on light, dark on dark, and also all of those get a variety of edges. So one of them has a hard edge, one of them has a soft edge, one of them has a lost edge, one of them has a medium edge, for example. Exactly. Um, and the way this often shows up in, let's say, character design or concept art presentation I think I saw Craig Mullins do this in a demo a long time ago on like the Sigen forums. Uh, same concept. To have um, actually make it a little bit brighter. Uh, the gradient happening that way in the background, and then you switch it as you just said, uh, in the way game, uh, James Gurney described it, like this, and naturally it just pops out. And then you would fill in the details of like, okay, let's put some shadows here. And, Whatever, but what it does is it brings all the attention where you want it, and yeah, if you can harness that, it really you're kind of unstoppable. And mm -hmm. if the audience wants to hear more stuff like this, they can go to Proco 2.0, right? Proco.com. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a, a pretty good idea. If I do say so myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stan's like, yes, <laughs> keep talking about yes, it. Yes, feed me, feed me. <laughs> well, well, we plugged your med map earlier, but now Stan's here, so we have to plug Proco 2.0. Factual statements are being put forth, yes. Oh, I don't hear, I don't hear Stan. Huh? I think you muted you yourself. <laughs> oh. I was going, yes, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, and then yes, I said, yes. it doesn't count if I don't hear it. Um, <laughs> Can we talk about Proco 2.0? I'm genuinely yeah, curious and not just trying to promote it. Sure. I swear. Yeah, what I do you swear. want to know? Um, well, just uh, it seems amazing. Um, I know it just launched. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to be the replacement for Art University? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know about the replacement. We're, I mean, we're just basically we're, we're trying to solve the issues that of online education. So yeah. It, for some people, we might be a replacement. For others, we might not. Like, you know, because not everybody can go to a university, and so yeah, I think that online has to have a legitimate uh, alternative. Um, what, Christian? Why are you? Cause, cause oh, you just saying yes? Just... No, no, we're on Steven Zapata's page. For <laughs> oh, oh, cool. <laughs> I mean, there are so many. It really is cool how many great resources are, there are, and I was. Yeah. Um, just you have so many people on there. I didn't even know yeah. uh, Trent was on there. I love his stuff. I've, he's uh, his stuff is super inspirational to me. Yeah, I mean, it it doesn't become really a school unless the the student can kind of have like a home base there. Yeah. And in order for that to happen, there has to be a lot of options for students to be able to to do stuff. And so yeah, um, yeah. Right right now, we're trying to just get as many as many instructors on as possible, Qual high quality instructors, of course. Um, 
because then students can kind of go through and pick their own paths. Um, yeah. Scott. Um, yeah, Scott. Oh, man. His stuff <laughs> is so good. Yeah. yeah he's awesome. Um, but, yeah, well, yeah, but of course. Tools, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, or sorry, one, one more thing. Um, but of, of course, also just like a big part of this is going to be just developing the website more, providing yeah. more tools. Um, cause right now all, the only option we have for teaching is the pre-recorded courses, right? And yeah. so we're working on like workshops, uh, private mentorships, um, paid critiques where, you know, students can just like pay, pay a little bit to get a critique That's on great. one specific thing. Yeah. And that, we, we need that stuff for, for students to be able to get what they need specifically. Cause not everybody needs to take, you know, S Scott's concept design course right mm -hmm. <laughs> like i mean yeah. that'd be great but then like well what now you maybe you need some more one-on-one -on -one attention for a few months or you need to just get feedback on a single piece and a school will give you those options but online it's it's a little bit it's very fragmented in order yeah. to get that kind of stuff so. that's a good point um i have yeah. a question i don't know if you can talk about it but um you're talking about the developing an ai for certain things like uh, perspective and maybe even anatomy. Yeah. Has, has there been any um, progress on that, or is it that something? Because it it seems like such an <sighs> undertaking. Yeah. So uh, the AI thing, we we were making progress, and then unfortunately, the uh, the team that I was working with, like, it, it was, I was working with another firm, an AI firm, and yeah. like almost everybody on the team on the project working with on my project, they quit that firm. Oh no! And so, and then that no. company spent like almost a year trying to like get some other people back in there, and then eventually I'm like, <laughs> no, we're yeah. done. Like, and so now I'm working with another company and trying to to get okay. other things started. So it, it's been unfortunately we lost a lot of time without any progress. Um, but but at least uh, you're still pursuing the idea because I yeah I oh, think absolutely it's a, yeah it's gonna, yeah it's important. I do think it's a great idea, especially for those um, like boxes and stuff, which are so obviously easy to not easy to automate but it seems like it would be the thing you could automate yeah we started with that because it's like well perspective is purely just math and so it yeah. seems like the easiest thing to to get and we we don't need not we don't always even need to use ai for that <laughs> like perspective okay. with perspective you don't need ai you just you have math that is mm -hmm. just it's formula oh, yeah true you the can algorithm just, uses to just exactly. check stuff you mm -hmm. don't need actual neural networks figuring out the yeah. answers you just have a calculator i loved it, i loved all computer programming and, and programs into ai but yeah you don't need that right yeah yeah it's not actually ai if it's just like a calculator i think uh, you you were talking about that on a drafting podcast uh yeah AI. yeah we have an episode on it but, yeah. but christian what were you gonna say oh sorry about that um yeah so, so i guess the goal is to you know like what you were saying stan just add a lot more tools so there's a like a figure reference timer in the works at some point, you know. So people. Oh yeah, that's pretty close actually. And yeah. So people, yeah. Yeah. So so you know all the model packs that you want on the site will automatically be included. You know you can check which things you want to draw from essentially, which yeah. the pose and stuff, and um, you know yeah. trying to like you know because everything is spread out across a bunch of different websites and tools now. The goal is to kind of, kind of consolidate everything so people can get critiques and actually get the reference and. You know, do everything on the on the site. Hopefully, yeah, That's yeah. Awesome. And we're we're talking with Graf Graphite. How do you pronounce it? It's uh, Graphite, I think, right? Graphite. Yeah, we're talking graffiti. with them. Graphite, yeah. graffiti, whatever. No one feeding. <laughs> graffiti. Yeah, Graf Graphite Studios to because yeah. they have a lot of amazing uh, reference, and so we were trying to get them to post their stuff on there. And I think oh, that'd be they're into it, but we'll see. I love that we've all said it probably incorrectly on all of our collective platforms yeah. it's <laughs> russian i don't know like what do you yeah. think <laughs> graphite yeah, russian. Russian. So I think well, i'm just surprised that they didn't tell you uh because i know you're working with them but i guess it makes sense uh, well but you know the way you pronounce something in russian true, uh, true might not be. plus i don't gra graffit it's probably graffit oh, but, okay. like but you're right. not gonna say it like that <laughs> no. yeah. if they're like Yes, and we, we work with Graphite Studio. <laughs> you're like, what? I'll just say it gra sounds like you're trying a little too hard. <laughs> they uh, yeah. they were kind enough to do an exclusive uh, photo shoot for my recent course that I. Oh, made. really? Oh, nice. Cool. Nice. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. They're they're great. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think this promo has been 
God for too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, <laughs> yeah, uh, art or something. <laughs> we've lost oh, everybody. Um, now I'm just thinking about AI. That's all I'm thinking about. <laughs> yeah. way off. Yeah. Can I just say to wheel back to AI for a second? Yeah. I would. I know or, this or is or like to- your, it's your stream. <laughs> yeah, oh, go, go for it. And let me say one thing about AI. <laughs> nice good job stan yeah i'm Uh, fighting myself i know this is totally like backwards but this like the absolute backwards point of wanting ai to help with art education but i you know those ais that if you feed them enough um like texts and emails they can pretend to be somebody i have given so many art crits online at this point that i wish i could just feed an ai (laughs) all of my art crits and that (laughs) students could just talk to it and it gave them really convincing art crits god i would pay a lot of money for that i think so i have access to open ai do you know what open ai is yeah yeah so i have access to their gpt3 um api or their tool whatever it's called and it's amazing. It's exactly what you're talking about. I mean, it's Elon Musk's like AI thing. Mm-hmm. What's the most common question you get? Let me feed it to this AI. What's the most common question that I get? Yeah. Um, we, can, we can see how good this thing is. Because it's the, not trained for artists at all. It's just trained yeah. on the whole internet. And so uh, I think it, but it's, sometimes it's amazing, the results. I think my the most common question I get is, uh, what exercises should I do to improve my shading? But I think that that's pretty specific for me. But that's definitely the most common one I get. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, it's really slow loading. What exercises? This is a fun little party. I use to yeah. improve. My... All right. Uh, let's see what it says. So stupid. This is a difficult question to answer. There are many different shading techniques. I recommend looking at a few different books on drawing to find a technique that suits you. There you go. (laughs) That sounds like a very generic idea. (laughs) Um, That ain't it. It needs to to recommend some of the books that always get recommended or something like that. Yeah, that's true. Can different look. types of shading include hatching, cross hatching, and stippling. Ooh, that's not bad. That's, <laughs> that's not, not bad, bad at all. All right. All of our jobs are going to be gone very soon. Great. Good to <laughs> Wait, know. Can you do another one? Yeah. Um, I get one because uh, I've been animating. I get how come you don't use onion skin? And that seems like it could be a, a single sentence answer. And I'm wondering if they have. Well, you kind of have to give it context. Oh, you true. Just say, true, why true. don't you use onion skin? <laughs> it's uh, going to give you a cooking answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this thing That's gets really, really cool. good results sometimes. It's kind of amazing. What if you search a specific artist? Like, what if you ask it, uh, how do I paint like Ahmed Al Dhuri? What Ooh. if you search that? Ooh, okay. How do I paint like Ahmed Al Medsmap.com. <laughs> Let's see. I mean, I don't know. Ahmed Al Dhuri has a signature continues. style. Wow. That, it's saying okay. that? No, Ahmed Al Dhuri has a signature style that is made up of a variety of colors, patterns, and textures. The no artist's way. art is a postmodern style which mixes elements of abstract Im- expressionism and pop art. To paint like Ahmed Al Dhuri, use a variety of paint colors, textures, and patterns. Experiment with shapes, textures, and colors to see what works best for your art. I, I don't know. Is this accurate at all? Low key, How not does it bad. Know that? That's low key, not bad. not bad, right there. <laughs> wow, it's, I'm shocked. It's probably faking all of this. Like it, it's just it's they making simultaneous sound contrast. like a real answer. That was pretty good. Yeah, it was that was pretty, pretty good. Not gonna lie. How do okay? I'm gonna do. How do I draw like modern day James? <laughs> just don't be good. <laughs> That is oh my god <laughs> what? oh no the same i would answer. recommend starting with tutorials on my youtube channel they no cover the way. fundamentals of drawing and provide a great foundation to build on <laughs> that's so weird how's it doing that <laughs> that's so crazy <laughs> this is amazing <laughs> yeah and this is not trained for art this is just this like is, whatever yeah. you want that's what's freaking me out. This is so niche and it still does it. That's I'm just happy it complimented me. It said, I provide a great fa- uh, foundation. So thank you, AI. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's talking as if it's like, it's you. I recommend my YouTube. That's cool. Yeah. That is crazy. <laughs> it is weird. That's wild. A lot of yeah. weird stuff happening to our civilization. Yeah.
And the better you improve the context of the question, the better the answer is because it knows everything. Man. Yeah, so crazy. it's weird. Anyway, sorry. No, that That's was cool. fine. That's so no. crazy. Yeah, we're all scared. We're all having existential fear now. That's good. Speaking of which, June 25th, I believe, is the deadline for the DOD to present to Congress. The, um... Oh, no. Now this is one of those streams. <laughs> <laughs> what? what is Something about, uh, about aliens. Talking... unidentified aerial phenomenon is what oh, I said. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've been following that. Oh, boy. No, no, I, can't, I can't talk too much about aliens. I won't be able to sleep tonight. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not comfortable with that discussion. It's fun yeah. stuff. Bobby Chu likes to talk about it when we're off of the uh, live uh, recording stuff. And well, so they surprise. have to tell the truth? They can't just lie yeah, about it? They're probably going to uh, present something that because you know they've declassified certain things, but I doubt they're going to be like, all right, well, we're in a galactic federation, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Med, Med, if the news goes that way, just a reminder, yeah. don't worry I, about me. All right? I know yeah. exactly what you're going to yeah. do. You, ha you handle yourself. Don't you worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the last time we saw Steven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that was a, that I don't was think a I would do anything different if we were in a galactic federation. I've thought about this. <laughs> I can't even draw right now. <laughs> uh, sorry. AI, me? aliens. Uh... Yeah, we're, we're, we're really lightly pretending this is still an art stream at this point. <laughs> I hope Congress uh, declassifies how to paint like Ahmed al Dhuri. That would be a really cool <laughs> reveal by Congress. That would be fun. That would be amazing. Yeah. All right. It actually is coming up to two hours. Um, yeah. uh, we probably could wrap oh, wow. this up. If all right. That's okay with you guys. Can you, can you make it full screen, Med, so that we can look uh, at it in all its glory? Yeah, sure. Hide that period. Mm. Stunning. Wow. Incredible. Feast your eyes. Wow. Wait, gaze yay sorry souls upon the incredible Whoa. art of Ahmed al Dhuri. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Amazing. It's just I sketch. love it, guys. Thank you, thank you. Don't say nice. that. Marshall <laughs> looks <laughs> just like Marshall. Like, like yeah. I love that. Yeah, Stan, you're hard like to draw. Too, Stan. Yeah. So if so if Stan is Sherlock and Marshall is Watson, then who's their Moriarty? Is Christian their Moriarty? <laughs> I guess I am. Yeah. Who's yeah, Moriarty? Um, yeah. hmm. Sherlock's arch nemesis. Mm. Probably Skelly. Uh, um, yeah. Skelly would be Moriarty. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. He's done more to undermine you than anyone else. That makes oh, a lot yeah. of sense. So, <laughs> Dan, can you guess the name of the hat that you're wearing? The name of the hat? Uh, the type of hat. It's it's not the mailman hat, the mailboy hat that I have, right? No. <laughs> the I can't put it on top of my headphones, but uh, yeah, it kind of uh, looks okay actually for some reason. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is this actually something that like only detectives wear, or is it, like more broad? It's more broad. It's, it's more, more broad. broad. Yeah. It has uh, to do with a specific activity. I don't know if that gives too much information. I. <laughs> Based off of just this painting, it's hard. It's like a bucket or something. Uh, can I see the reference you're using for sure. it? Sure. Wait a minute. Those flaps come down, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They unbutton and they come down and they. Uh huh. Why would you need to do that's Something loud will be happening. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking hunting. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. But in the but then I was thinking cold for protecting your ears. I was like that nah, doesn't look like a hat that'll keep it's you warm. Both those things. But do you, now that you say like that. It, it's probably like hunting rats or something. <laughs> weird. Close, so close. Dude. You're right. It, it was only oh, that close. Hunting hunting yeah. Way closer than, than us. No, no, so he what? got it. It's it's a rat hunter. Oh. <laughs> no, come on. What was it? It's just stupid. It's it's called a, a deer stalker hat. That's what it's called. Oh, for stalking or actually hunting? Stalking. It's called a deer stalker. Just, just, just to stalk it's them. The same thing. It's only right? for stalking deer. It's so that you sit in a car outside the deer's apartment and you yeah. wait for it to come out. <laughs> oh, you have to deer it. like your honey. You have to stalk switch your, your cap right when you shoot. It's, uh, it's a very weird process. Hey. Uh, hunting strange. If you do the boxing match, you should wear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel the event. 
<laughs> no, come on. I was going to call it. I really want to call that fight. It's like, in this corner, in the skeleton theme trunks, weighing in at 2.25 million subscribers, Stan <laughs> Prokopenko! <laughs> uh, you do sound pretty good. You do sound and pretty good. And in the other corner, in the box shaped trunks, weighing in at 350,000 subscribers, Modern day James. <laughs> Come on, I got wow. this. Yeah, that, that was impressive. not bad. That was not bad. Well, we'll, we'll do it in another decade, ten years. <laughs> All right. So you guys want to call it? I'm yeah, done. It was a really good stream. A lot of fun. Thanks for joining us, Stan. Was, uh, Great painting, man. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll send this over to Christian. See if he wants to play around with it. <laughs> What does that mean? I don't know. Use it for a thumbnail someday. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. I don't know if you noticed <laughs> my shirt. Just yeah, kind of I, I noticed. You're just going pro, pro co promo all the way today. That's, That's right. Great. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Appreciate um, it. But you got to gotta the, promote your course right now, though. Uh, yes. Which course? My your pro course. course or whatever you want. Any course. It's your well, stream, man. Oh, well, in that case, I do have this brand new <laughs> meds map. There Start you learning today at a fraction of the price of what you pay at Art Center, which is kind of cringe. Um, <laughs> but once you uh, pick your package, you get to uh, join the community. If I could pull that up. Um, and maybe post your work and all that fundamentals, learn to paint, and come across some chance encounters, whatever. The, oh, whoa, whoa, you're not supposed mean? to see that. I don't, my bad. Um, uh, uh -oh. Wait, who was that? <laughs> don't do that to me Please. was that steven that what it couldn't be i don't no no way i don't <laughs> nice yeah, wow was... what are you doing steven yeah. <laughs> just, um... look if someone asks me for a favor i follow through that's me that's what i do yeah yeah and, and just okay. like, oh whoa my i didn't wow. that wasn't supposed to happen um on stream there but yeah we might have like four or five of those the fun nice. little encounters <laughs> Anyway, um, I'm going to he never skims on production value. He never skims on production value. I'll tell you that. It's always been the case. Always been the case. <laughs> thanks, nice. man. Yeah, um, we decided to go all the way with that. Anyway, yeah, cool. thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, chat, you've all been great. Thanks for all the questions. And if you guys have any last words to kind of offer the chat. Um, um, I would say subscribe to Steven Zapata. I would say subscribe to James, Stan, Med, and Christian's doing a podcast someday. So subscribe mm -hmm. to him. The van podcast. The yeah, my van, my van cast. Can't wait. Can't wait That's for the true. van cast. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So thanks for everyone for being here. And I will uh, hopefully see you on the other side. Sam, and thank you know. so much for letting us do this. Yeah. yeah.